This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, this is Dr. Deepak Meghur and today I'm here with another case of a, a non-dilating pupil with an hypermature cataract and uh, I made the side port incisions and uh, it's quite tricky to stain the anterior capsule in these small pupils because sometimes the peripheral capsule will not get stained. So one trick would be to just go under the pupillary margin and inject the dye so that the peripheral part of the capsule under the pupil also gets stained. So once I've done the manure, I'm washing the trepan blue PSS and then I'm using dispersive OVD in the antechamber under the cornea to protect the endothelium. And I'm also using a little bit of this OVD under the pupillary margin. It just tends up the iris a little bit so that it's easier for me to perform the stretch pupilloplasty without touching the anterocapsule. So I'm using Y-hook to do this uh, maneuver. It's an excellent tool for this. Uh, I usually perform this stretch maneuver in four different planes, two vertically and two oblique. And fortunately in this case, the pupil has expanded significantly enough. And uh, so I aborted the idea of using any pupil expansion device in this case. So I need to do the rexus. Because this was a hypermature cataract, we can see a central small zone of uh, a calcified plaque here. So I'm consciously trying to avoid that area. Uh, I make an initial puncture uh, in the paracentral region and then fold the capsule and then performing the rexus uh, with the forceps. Uh, luckily, as we can see here, the rest of the capsule seems quite healthy. So performing the rexus uh, is relatively easy. And as I'm performing it, you can see that the underlying subcapsular plaque which was central has come out with the anterior capsule itself. So once the rexus is done, now the job is to perform a fake emulsification of the nucleus. To begin with, I perform gentle hydrodissection and try to rotate the nucleus to ensure that there are no corticocapsular adhesions. I plan to do a direct vertical chop for this case and my strategy for most of these hard nucleus is always to create a small trench initially. I'm just doing a sculpting in the central part of the nucleus. The idea is to get a firm grip when doing the chopping maneuver. Then I bury my phaco tip until the entire tip is uh, invisible and only the sleeve is seen. And then I go in with my sharp vertical chopper and do the vertical chop followed by lateral separation. Uh, as soon as the first chop is there, there is a small release of the grip. Again, we give a small burst of fake energy, rebury it and then uh, perform the chop. Again, bury the nucleus until the entire tip is buried inside and then the chopper goes in vertically down and then laterally separates the fragment. The fragment momentarily is released. Again, you do a short burst of fake energy to re-grasp it again and perform the maneuver. We continue to do this maneuver of holding and chopping until we have got a significant number of pieces which are then individually phaco aspirated out. When I am in the quadrant removal mode, I usually use uh, just the torsional part of the energy. You don't have to use the longitudinal energy. The second instrument is always stays on top of the nucleus. The phaco power is used judiciously so that the nucleus is not uh, flying around in the antechamber. It just sticks onto the uh, phaco tip and then gets emulsified. So bury until the entire uh, tip is uh, into the submerged into the nucleus and then perform uh, the chop. So I'm just trying to emulsify the fragment in a very controlled fashion. 
uh, I'm ensuring that the nucleus just doesn't fly away from the uh, tip of the phagos, it's just always adhering to the tip and it uh, is dancing around the tip so that we don't have small fragments which is just flying around in the antechamber and hitting the cornea. So once the nucleus fragment is out, now one important thing we can notice is that at this stage uh, the glow doesn't seem to be there at all and uh, what we're seeing here is a blue glow. Once the cataract is out we can see that the uh, we're seeing a blue glow instead of an orange or red glow. The reason obviously is because uh, trypan blue has migrated uh, uh, into the posse chamber, probably into the burger space and uh, it is a testimony of the fact that you know the transzonal barrier is quite permeable to fluid especially in eyes where we have got this generalized zonular weakness and the barrier is predominantly I think more in our mind than than factual especially in some eyes. In this case obviously we didn't have any issue with fluid misdirection and the AC getting shallow. The dye in the vitreous is a fact that you know once the fluid can get in, sometimes it can cause fluid misdirection. In this case, it was harmless. It just was this absence of glow. An absence of glow itself can be uh, challenging because we are used to doing the further maneuvers in the presence of a glow. But this is a possibility which we need to keep in mind. Uh, I mean, in this case, the lens was implanted, no issue. And further, in the post-operative period also, we need to understand that it's uh, innocuous. There's no uh, effect on the retina. I think the dye just gets absorbed in two days' time and everything would be fine. That's it. The case is done and I hope that you found this uh, interesting. Thank you.